and welcome to HCI International Public Policy Making. Uh, I'm Carrie Carajalios. I'm one of the associate editors of Foundations and Trends at HCI, and welcome to the Foundations and Trends of HCI talk and panel. I, this is a weird structure for most panels. I'll start briefly by introducing Foundations and Trends. Um, our, then I'll introduce our speaker today, Jonathan Lazar. Uh, who will be presenting his paper, a paper he led, and our five panelists will be discussing their work at the intersection of HCI and public policy in a panel moderated by Jonathan. Um, Foundations and Trends in HCI is a unique journal-style publication that runs survey articles summarizing subdomains of HCI. Each publication is crafted to provide scaffolding in which researchers, practitioners can hang their work to stir imagination to inspire new and exciting work. We like to think of it as surveys by top experts with a point of view and forward looking to inspire younger scholars. We publish four to six of these articles a year, each article constituting an entire issue unto itself, essentially a book, with 30 articles to date. As an important additional feature, authors retain copyright so they can distribute the article on personal websites and reuse the work at will. To get even more visibility, we have presentation slots at Kai. So earlier this afternoon, in the slot just before this one, two papers were presented by Indrani Menifis and Aaron Brady. And now, um, we have another paper that's going to be presented by Jonathan, followed by uh, a panel. So Jonathan is going to speak for roughly 20 minutes. Um, the panel is going to continue after that. It's going to be moderated by Jonathan. And I am going to introduce Jonathan very briefly. Um, he's a professor of computer information sciences and the service director of the undergraduate program in information systems at Towson University since 2003. He founded the U Universal Usability Laboratory at Towson University and served as director from 2003 to 2014. Within the area of human computer interaction, he's involved in teaching and research in web accessibility for people with disabilities, user centered design methods, assistive technology, and public policy. He has authored or edited 10 books, including Ensuring Digital Accessibility Through Process and Policy, um, Research Methods in Human Computer Interaction, Universal Usability, Designing Computer Interfaces for Diverse User Populations, and Web Usability, User Centered Design Approach. His newest book, co edited with Michael Stein of Harvard Law, is titled Global Inclusion, Disability, Human Rights, and Information Technology, and will be published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in mid 2016. He's published over 140 refereed articles and journals, um, has numerous awards, patents. He frequently serves as an advisor to government agencies, regularly provides testimony at the federal and state level, and multiple US federal regulations cite his research publications. He frequently partners with disability advocacy groups in his research, including the National Federation of the Blind and National Down Syndrome Congress, and often presents outside of the HCI community, including educational and legal venues. <laughs> um, and just one thing I just want to say, um, yesterday he received the Sukai Social Impact Award. Um, so let's introduce, um, so let's give him a round of applause. All right, good afternoon everyone and thank you very much for coming to, it's a short paper presentation followed by a panel discussion. And I want to clarify that this article in Foundations and Trends about human computer interaction and public policy making internationally there are actually 31 co-authors. Uh, I was the coordinator and lead author, but of all of the people who are serving on the panel today were all co-authors of this article. And it was based out of a workshop that was held at CHI 2013 in Paris, France, about public policy and human computer interaction and what steps we could take to really create a framework for understanding the topic. So I'd like to start just with a short overview of the article, I mean, the article is about 78 pages. This is a very brief overview because really we want to get to the panelists. Uh, so what I will talk about is just the introduction and background to the topic, human computer interaction and public policy, uh, looking at two different aspects. First of all, how human computer interaction can inform public policy, then how public policy actually influences the work that we do in human computer interaction, then suggested actions for human computer interaction involving public policy. So first it's important to understand that public policy is a core component of any type of social system. Right? And as people work in human computer interaction, often public policy is something that seems a little bit foreign. You know, we're, we're trained in graduate school to study science and engineering and math, all the STEM areas 
But very rarely do we study public policy or understand the connection between public policy and the work we do either as computer scientists more generally or specifically in human-computer interaction. Typically, when you look at science policy, there are two different aspects of this. Uh, policy that influences science, so public policies that actually influence how work is done and what rules and how things get funded, and then how that specific field of science can influence policies themselves. Now, historically, the field of human-computer interaction has been very interested in how technology can impact the quality of life. So historically, we've been looking at how can we make life better? How can we make the world of technology more inclusive? How can we improve safety? How can we bridge gaps and form connections between people who don't see uh, each other very often? How can we improve education outcomes and employment outcomes? As a field of human-computer interaction, we've always been very interested in improving the quality of life. But public policy is something that really is important, but we don't often talk about. And when you do often read articles about public policy in ACI, what you see is maybe one story. There's one story of one public policy issue in one country. And you don't get to see the overall view. And, and before this article, there's never really been a, a framework, a high-level view of public policy and ACI in different countries, in different topic areas. And it's important to understand that public policy is influenced in so many different ways by the country you're in, different political and legal systems, different cultural expectations. What is public policy? Because sometimes it feels like maybe it's a little bit hard to get your hands around. It includes many different things. It includes statutory laws and regulations. And regulations often help interpret laws. So if there's a law requiring a cer certain thing, the regulation will provide technical guidance right, on how to implement and interpret that. There are executive orders and administrative decrees that say, here's what we're going to do as an executive agency. In some countries, transparency in government is very high, and others it's very low. And certainly, open government and transparency has an impact on ACI and public policy. There are rules on implementation, on how you implement certain laws, certain policies. Also, the role of case law and lawsuits. In some countries, like the United States, that plays a much bigger role than other countries. Right? There are international treaties. So two treaties that relate closely to human-computer interaction are the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the Marrakesh Treaty, which deals with uh, facilitating access to printed materials for people who have print disabilities. There are international technical standards, and so we're talking about technical standards from, for instance, the Web Accessibility Initiative, from W3C, other standards. There are standards from ISO as well. And there are trade unions and other NGOs, non-governmental organizations, such as the UN, so there's really a lot. Public policy encompasses a lot. But it's important to understand that policy is different from politics. People in human-computer interaction often say, no, I don't really like politics. But policy is something different than politics. And most HCI issues are nonpartisan. So if you think of many of the hot topics today, if you think of issues like stem cell research and climate change, these are issues where there might be some partisan divide between left and right, between conservative and liberal, where there might already be existing infrastructures of lobbyists and think tanks and donors and advertising campaigns. None of this really exists for most of the issues that we're interested in within HCI and public policy. They're not well-defined political structures. HCI issues are not a conservative or a liberal issue. And this is a great opportunity for the HCI community because if you talk with most public policymakers, they will say, what's HCI? They don't have an understanding of it. They don't have a background or training in it. And this is really, really a great opportunity. This is a great opportunity to educate policymakers and make connections, right, to build relationships over time, so that in the future, we will have ongoing relationships. We will have an impact. Policymakers and the policymaking community will rely on us. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are really two different aspects of public policy right, and science. So you have, first of all, when a science community, like the HCI community, is proactive and works to inform the public policy so that they are based on research and data. 
And there are many fewer examples when we've been successful doing that than in the other direction when you have the uh, public policies which influence and put in requirements for our HCI work. But one of the areas that we have been most successful as the HCI community is in the area of accessibility. People who do human-computer interaction work have been involved with technical standards related to web accessibility. These technical standards, such as the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, such as other guidelines relating to browsers and relating to assistive technology, related to non-web technologies, these technical standards created by experts, done on an international basis, have helped form the foundation for most laws around the world that relate to accessibility of technology. So for instance, in the United States, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which requires that all government technology at the federal level, public or for federal employees, must be accessible for people with disabilities. The Americans with Disabilities Act requires it for state and local government and public accommodations. And what's the foundation for all of those, all of those laws in the United States? The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And you can look around the world. If you look at the Equality Act in England, or the Stanka Act in Italy, if you look at the EU mandate, the European Union mandate 376, which relates to accessible technology for all EU governments, what's the foundation for that? The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which were created in part by people who work in the area of human-computer interaction. And there are a lot of other really interesting ways that accessibility relates to public policy and we play a role. There's a group of HCI researchers who are working on the global public inclusive infrastructure. Let me ask, by show of hands or say yay, how many people have heard of the GPII before? Okay, we had one hand. So the GPII basically is an infrastructure so that wherever you log in from, your preferred settings can be accessed related to font size, related to speed, things like that. Uh, there's actually a human rights treaty, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities signed and ratified by many countries around the world. Articles 9 and 21 of that human rights document specifically address accessibility of technology. So accessibility is an area where really the HCI community has been able to really impact public policy. And we've had some other successes related to international technical standards, for instance, for usability. Ergonomic standards. Aki is going to talk a little bit about those ergonomic standards in a bit. Um, many of the countries around the world, especially the EU countries, have what's known as a digital agenda, a national technology plan to get more people online. And there have been a lot of HCI components in those digital agendas. We even had two people from the HCI community who have served in national government roles. So for instance, uh, Jan Gullickson has been the digital champion of Sweden. It's a national role. Right here on our panel, Lori Craner, is the chief technologist of the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. So we've had some great successes, but there are many more areas where public policy impacts human-computer interaction that we have not really made an impact, we have not gotten involved, we have not made the connections that we need to make. And these areas include areas where there are, again, laws, policies, regulations that impact human-computer interaction work. Many countries have laws related to the involvement of human participants in research. And obviously in HCI, we do a lot of research involving people to understand how they interact with technology. So different countries have different approaches. Some use regulations, some use institutional review boards. And it also relates in many ways to what the cultural tradition of that country is, how they approach it, whether it's through uh, openness and transparency or uh, providing very specific rules. In terms of measurement, measurement is actually something that there are many public policies relating to, and it influences HCI work. For instance, in Brazil, they've had some challenges for Brazilian HCI researchers because the government of Brazil has actually set up these rules for how different computer science journals are ranked. And then that will influence who gets hired who gets to stay on as an academic or as a researcher, and who gets research funding. 
and these ACI journals were not ranked very high. So the people who were doing ACI research found it harder to get jobs and harder to get funding. Those are public policies. In some countries, when you apply for funding, when you apply to do work, you have to specify the ethical or societal impacts. So you have to say specifically, here's how this work could help society. There are standards for measurement. For instance, there is a common industry format that relates to how you measure usability. Now, we already talked a little bit about accessibility in the last section, but there are laws for interface design that relate to language. In many countries, there are laws that say your website, if you are government, must be offered in the following three languages or four languages. For instance, in Canada, all government websites must be in English and French. In other countries, they may require three languages, four languages. And it depends, often there's a split between a government website of what it must offer and a public accommodation, like, like a company or a museum. We started talking about funding, and funding is so important to the ACI community. And that's why when government funding agencies choose what research gets funded, that really charts the direction for ACI research in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And so when a government agency, and again, much ACI research is still funded by governments, by national governments, by regional governments, by multinational governments. Other research is funded by industry and NGOs, but more of the theoretical research is funded by government. And so what that means is that if, for instance, the national government decides we're not funding ACI research, that could really stifle the ACI growth in that country or in that topic area, even if let's say it's decided that, for instance, recommender systems are important, but perhaps human and robot interaction is not important. Okay, well then, that research will not get done. So funding mechanisms are really important. Based on their history and their culture, many countries take very different approaches to data privacy laws and regulations. So, Issues such as, for instance, do you have to be notified before there's a cookie that's used, before you are tracked online? Do you have the right to access your personal data and control it? Can companies store data about you that you cannot, that you cannot get access to? These are fascinating issues in many ways, in many cases, how a government decides to handle privacy relates to the cultural traditions of that country. There are issues like intellectual property law which is something we don't often talk about, but that has a big bearing as well on human-computer interaction work. For instance, I mentioned earlier about the Marrakesh Treaty. So the Marrakesh Treaty, which deals with making sure that people with print disabilities have equal access to reading materials, it has two core aspects. One core aspect relates to making sure that national intellectual property laws national laws in the country have an exception so that you can transform the format of reading material you know, into an accessible format, into large print, braille, audio, digital, without violating copyright. Right? And so some countries already have existing exceptions, but some do not. And the idea is that authorized organizations should be able, under the law, to make sure that people with print disabilities, so people, for instance, who have trouble either seeing print, cognitively processing print, or physically handling print, have equal access to educational and reading materials. And the other example relates to cross-border flows of materials. So once you, for instance, created a digital accessible copy of a Harry Potter book in England, right, and it's properly marked up, and blind people can use it, and people with learning disabilities can use it. Uh, currently, before the Marrakesh Treaty, you could not transfer that English language version from the United Kingdom to Canada, the US, Australia, or any other country. So treaties relating to intellectual property law actually relate to what we do in interface design and getting access. We also need to know about user interface elements, which in many cases can be copyrighted, and functionality which can receive patent protection. Those impact what we can do because we can't violate copyrights or patents when we create new interface designs. So there is so much in public policy that impacts the work we do in HCI. 
And there are many domains of work that have very specific <laughs> rules and laws related to what we can and cannot do within ACI. For instance, in the e-government realm, there are laws and regulations in many countries related to what data you can collect from citizens who are visiting a government website. Whether or not you can do user testing. In some cases, you are limited in your ability to do user testing by existing laws. I believe Juan Pablo will address that in the panel. For public libraries, there are questions of, when it comes to collecting data, you go to the public library, you use a computer, you search for information. Those records of search, are they public records? Are they private? Are they destroyed? Can you use a subpoena to get access to those? So there are many questions about things like privacy, things like filtering, and whether the interface in a public library right, clearly lets you know that your search results are being filtered. Voting, and Ted's gonna talk a little bit about voting. As we have moved over the last two, three decades from paper ballots for voting, to in many countries we've moved to some form of electronic voting, whether it's touchscreen voting, whether it's ballots that you mark up and scan, whether it's online voting, voting is a very regulated domain related to the interfaces and what type of testing must be done and what languages must be offered and how you have to make sure there are accessible options for people with disabilities. In the area of healthcare and electronic health records, there are many regulations in different countries related to that, related to whether you can have access to that information, related to how the data on medical records must be shared or not shared, how it is presented, what you can find out about it. And in education, in both higher education, where many countries have rules related to the accessibility of technology in higher education for people with disabilities, or primary education and secondary education, where often we talk more about issues such as filtering and providing different, uh, different types of access and making sure that deaths are ergonomic so that children don't get injuries. There are a lot of domain areas where there are public policies that really impact the work of ACI. And notice how many more areas there are where public policies influence ACI than ones where the ACI community has in the past been successful and been a partner. And so in this article with the 31 co-authors from 10 countries, we provided some suggestions for how to move forward and how to increase the involvement of the ACI community in public policy. It's really important that the ACI community, and we're talking about large organizations like SIGCHI, that a reputation is built where public policy makers know they will find partners, they will find people to collaborate with, they will find an organization that wants to work with them. We want to encourage as an organization SIGCHI wants to encourage as many people as possible to get involved with two existing policy groups. So the parent organization, ACM, Association for Computing Machinery, they have two public policy groups called USACM and EUACM. One deals with public policy across all areas of computing in the US. The other deals with public policy uh, across all the EU countries related to computing. Obviously, there's a big limitation there. There's no ACM infrastructure right now for getting involved in public policy if you're not in either the US or an EU country. But they're working on that, and I strongly encourage you to reach out to ACM and encourage them to build out that infrastructure. Now, we need to do more as an ACI community to build awareness of ACI in the general culture. If you ask most people, what does a cybersecurity expert do? They'll know. What does a programmer do? They'll know. If you ask people, what does an interface designer do? What does a UX designer do? What is HCI? They'll say, I don't know. One way to change that is by getting HCI content into more university curricula. So it needs to be in curriculum standards, the, the models for curriculum in computing, computer science, information systems, and information technology. We need to get more about HCI as a requirement in those curriculum models. And the ACI community needs to hold more events, more events like this at a CHI conference, more annual workshops. We need to do more to make sure there are more venues for people who are interested in human-computer interaction and public policy. 
Now, those are suggestions at an organizational level. Next are some suggestions at an individual level. What can you personally, individually do to get involved with public policy? What are individual actions that you can take? A good way to start is to start building relationships with your legislators, with your policymakers. That's a great way to start, because often, for instance, national governments, regional governments, local governments, they'll say, yeah, we've got this problem. We don't know which websites are accessible or we don't know if people can easily find information. We don't know how people are interacting with e-government. There are many times where either due to resources or due to existing laws, governments cannot actually do user research. They can't do it. And that's a great role for individuals with expertise in ACI. We can go to our local policymaker and say, what questions do you have that need answered? What can we do research on? Many times, governments look for uh, people to serve on advisory committees. They look for scientific advisory committees. And again, our wonderful panel will start in a few minutes. Juan Pablo is on a government advisory committee. You can go testify to a legislature. If there are bills that are being considered for uh, possible, possibly being turned into a law, that's a great time to go testify if it's in your area of expertise. Go get involved, go testify, go share your expertise, because we want public policies and laws and regulations that are based on scientific data, not on stories. We want it based on scientific data. We want it based on our research, the research of the HCI community, the combined expertise. So go, testify to your legislature. If you're in a country where they use regulatory processes, which means that they put out a proposed rule or maybe an advance notice of a proposed rule and they solicit public feedback, that's a great opportunity to respond. When it's open for public comment, respond. Say, I work in HCI, and here's why I think this bill, uh, why, excuse me, I think this regulation is well-structured, or why I think it might need some additions or modifications. But the point is, our basis to respond to all of these is our expertise, our years of expertise in practice, in research, in education. Now, many times, the way we communicate as HCI educators, researchers, and practitioners is that we send someone, hey, here's my Chi, chi paper, let me email it to you. That's not how you interact with policymakers. They won't read your Chi paper, and if you're not meeting with them face-to-face, -face, most policymakers will, it'll just fly right by them. So if you want to start a relationship with a local public policymaker, set up a meeting. Set up a face-to-face -face meeting. Go meet with them. Don't just do it when you have an issue you want to address. Say, hi, I'm one of your constituents. I have an area of expertise that relates to some of the things that are being considered. I would just like to come in and talk with you. I don't have a specific agenda. Start a relationship. You will have the most impact on a public policymaker when you have built a relationship over time where they know they can call on you, they know that they can trust you, they know that sometimes they may need some help and you will help them. Don't expect that you're gonna be able to take credit for things publicly, that's okay you will know the impact that you have, right? Sometimes you will get credit. Like if your research is cited in a regulation, people will know. Other times you may have, this sometimes happens, a public policymaker will say, I can't officially meet with you. Can you meet me across the street at the Starbucks? Can, is that way you don't sit from the building? Could I just talk to you for about 20 minutes? Can I tell you those are some of my favorite interactions? So please learn more about public policy. Do your best, learn what the issues are, the regulations, the bills, where your interests in HCI intersect with public policy, and then make those connections with policymakers. Respond to regulatory processes. Talk to your government officials, find out if there are areas of research that would be really helpful. And once you've done this, and you've been successful, and you've been charged up, and you've been excited, then you can become one of the members of our community who takes a leave of absence and goes and becomes a policymaker like Lori Craner. So this is an overview of what the article says, and an overview of what we believe needs to be done, how we can increase the amount of engagement that the HCI community and individuals in the community have with public policy. Now we're gonna move on to the panel discussion. And we have five fantastic panelists. I also want to note that Vatya Freeman was supposed to join us, uh, but due to um, a family member who's ill, she was unable to join us. So five fantastic people. Lori Craner, who 
who is a professor of computer science and engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon, but is currently on leave serving as the chief technologist at the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Juan Pablo Urcad, who is an associate professor of computer science at the University of Iowa and a member of the U.S. Census Bureau's Scientific Advisory Committee. I'm a professor of computer science at Towson University, and they gave me an introduction already, so I won't say anything else. Ted Selker is Director of Research on Accessible Voting at UC Berkeley, had also worked at the MIT Media Lab and uh, Carnegie Mellon, and previously co-directed the Caltech MIT Voting Technology Project. Herrick Vanderveer was the president of SIGCHI from 2009 to 2015, recipient of the IPIC TC13 Pioneer Award and the SIGCHI Lifetime Service Award, and he's also been very involved with local policymakers in the Netherlands. And Ake Waldios is an associate professor of human computer interaction at KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, and he's an appointed expert to two of the ISO ergonomic standards working groups. So I want to start with a question for all the panelists. For a lot of people out there, they're saying, I don't have a background in HCI, uh, excuse me, I don't have a background in public policy, I have a background in HCI, but how do I get into public policy? How did you get interested in public policy? How, did, did you study it? Did you always want to do public policy? How did you get involved? So I want to ask each panel individually, and we'll do about, uh, about two, three minutes of panelists. Maybe we can start on that end uh, with Ted Selker. How did you get involved in, uh, in public policy? How did your interest get peaked? Ted, please, go ahead. So my mother and my family have always been interested in, in public policy, but I never did anything. One day, Nicholas Negroponte uh, sent a message around I have to go to a press uh, release in one hour about uh, the voting problem that just happened. What should I say? So I, did, I just sent him a message and I said, well, whenever something really, um, is really uh, important, it's a little scary. And when you don't do it very often, it's hard to do also. So how, uh, how simple it is uh, over, over those other two issues uh, affects how, how uh, much chance you get out of a mistake. Well, he loved that and he said, you're it. And uh, David Baltimore and Nicholas uh, and, and Chuck Best, the presidents of MIT and Caltech, they got a bunch of money from Carnegie, and uh, we were off and running, uh, writing a uh, piece called uh, Voting What Has Been and What It Will Be, which um, has been a very important paper in terms of showing that actually usability was the number one reason that votes were lost in 2000. Okay, great. Eric? Yeah, I'm from the Netherlands, which is a small country in Europe. Um, and like many countries in Europe, the political system is a multi-party democracy. Multi-party meaning that in a parliament or in the city council, you can typically find anywhere between seven and 15 different political parties. And in the 70s, for eight years, I have been a member of the city council. I was an elected party delegate. So I was elected by the, by the, the the people in the city. Um, and uh, in, in that system, uh, the city council um, initiates changes and votes on local laws, regulations, permits for industries, permits for building societies, for local traffic, for transport, and for educational institutes. Quite a lot of things. And in the Netherlands at that time, universities, or yeah, some universities, had the institute of what they call a science shop. So uh, whenever there was, uh, in, in the city council, there was a, a, a request for giving a permit for, for instance, a, a chemical industry, which, which actually happened since several cases in my city, I went to the science shop of my university and, and I could require to talk with, uh, with a chemical specialist and with, with a medical specialist about the amount of emission that, that the industry under the current regulations would build would produce and, and about the, the health situation for the citizens around, so about how far from, from the building societies, from, from, the, from the houses the, the emission could, could take place or what kind of measures should be taken. So, so it was actually the political bodies that asked science, scientists and, and there were ways to ask the scientists about the effects of decisions. Some political parties did, some political parties did not. I did all the time. And, and in that way, science was requested to influence actual political decision making. 
and, and political monitoring. So this is what well, the, the way it works, and I think it works in many important countries. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I got, um, yeah. I got uh, into policy work through a project we carried out at the KTH uh, together with two other universities and two trade union centers. Uh, since 1992, the Swedish Confederation of Professional Employees has performed a hardware environmental certification program. Uh, they developed it together with the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation and the Swedish National Board for Industrial and Technical Development. And together with researchers in agronomics, the manufacturers, um, and today the TCO certified covers in excess of 500 million computer screens. So uh, this is uh, an example of a user uh, organization together with environmentalists and researchers that they can create a de facto standard that covers hardware ergonomics, emissions, energy, um, but it has a profound impact in the marketplace. Uh, and today the TCO certified auto screen uh, screens the social responsibility of manufacturers. And uh, it's all documented in uh, an interesting book about a de facto standard. So between 2002 and 2011, this story was replicated, and I had the luck to become part of it. Uh, now the blue and the white color union centers cooperated. Hundreds of local union members participated with a group of HCI researchers from three universities. Now it was not about shaping the man on hardware, uh, but on workplace software. Office workers at Ericsson and Volvo and doctors and nurses at the big hospitals in Sweden had, had enough of bad usability in their enterprise resource planning systems and electronic healthcare records. So some 12 national and brand specific, uh, specific use of service were down. Yearly price contests for best workplace system were held for 10 years in a row. Um, and eight major software packages were awarded the use of certified 2002 or 2006 certificates. So the software providers that won the award found it priceless. And both users and management at the buying company were happy. Although the user support program is uh, now transformed, and never reached the de facto standard uh, status. Uh, we regard it as the approval concept of what user organizations and HCI researchers can do. Um, you can find the uh, example described in, with reference to further readings on page 25 in the article and page 20 in the report. Very nice, thank you. Great. So when I was an undergraduate engineering student, um, I was actually interested in public policy. And um, uh, I was at uh, Washington University in St. Louis where they actually had an undergraduate major at the time called engineering and public policy. I, I wasn't entirely sure what it was, but, but that's what I majored in. Um, and then I went on to get a master's and PhD in engineering and public policy. And, I picked up a master's in computer science on the way, mostly by accident, but that's another story. Um, so uh, I, I focused on internet policy issues, um, electronic voting especially. Um, and then I also did a summer program um, where I worked in the IEEE USA office for a summer um, and, and looked at public policy issues there. When I graduated, I went to AT&T Labs and joined, um, they just started a department called the Public Policy Research Department. And I don't think they knew what it was, um, but since I had a degree in engineering public policy, they figured I'd probably belong there, and they hired me. Um, and I got there and I still didn't really know what I was doing. Um, there was interest in uh, a privacy standard and I had nothing better to do, so I decided to go find out what that was all about and um, joined a working group at W3C. And um, I still didn't really fully appreciate what I was getting myself into until they sent me to my first international meeting. 
it was a, a meeting of the International Data Protection Commissioners, and they wanted me to come talk about this standard we were working on. And I walked into the room, and there were all these people wearing suits and headsets for simultaneous translation. And <laughs> I said, I, I, don't, I don't know what I've gotten myself into. This seems like some diplomatic thing. I have no training in this. Um, but I, I was a quick study. I, I, I got up to speed. Um, I learned a lot about um, international privacy laws, privacy laws in, uh, in different countries, and what was going on in the U.S. in privacy and public policy. Um, in, the US, in the U.S., the, the Federal Trade Commission was considering privacy regulations, and so they were having a whole series of hearings and workshops and so I regularly submitted uh, comments, uh, was invited to speak there. And uh, as one of the few technologists who went and spoke, the FTC staff um, was very interested in what I had to say. Mostly they had lobbyists and lawyers speaking to them. Um, but once they realized that that's not what I was, um, they would come and ask me their questions. And so they would call me after the hearing and, and say, yeah, could you explain to us again how third party cookies work? And, yeah, we, we, we have the, these questions. And uh, so I, I got to know them um, and, and work with them. Um, as part of this process of developing the, this privacy standard, um, that's actually how I got into HCI. So I came about this a little bit backwards. Um, I, I had taken one HCI course um, in college, that was all they had, uh, and I was working on a privacy standard that was supposed to focus on the back end of the system. And I realized that without a good front end, this would be completely useless, and nobody was looking at the front end. And so um, I, I got funding from, from my boss at AT&T to develop a privacy user agent. And then I said, I had no idea how to build such a thing. Um, and so I went down the hall to the HCI group, and I said, teach me something. What <laughs> do I need to know to, to actually build a usable um, privacy user agent? Um, so that's how I got into it. Um, after I left AT&T, I went to Carnegie Mellon, uh, where I have been doing um, work in usability and privacy and security and public policy. Uh, I continue to participate in um, FTC workshops and whatnot. I've uh, testified um, for Congress. I was in an FTC um, advisory committee. Uh, I was on a DARPA uh, privacy advisory committee. Uh, and then um, last year, I was approached uh, by the FTC about uh, joining them as, as chief technologist. Uh, and I've been there since January. Fantastic. All right, Juan Pablo. All right, that, that's a tough story to follow. <laughs> uh, but it gives me something I want to say, so that's good. So I would say, I'm, even as a child, I had an interest, a strong interest in history, uh, and I think that developed into an interest in public policy and government, uh, even when in high school and college, so that interest was there. I never quite saw a connection, though, with my interest in, in computing, and I was a, always been a computer science major um, through all my studies. Uh, and I didn't see the connection until the same time that Ted saw it, I think. <laughs> Year 2000, yeah. uh, Butterfly Ballot had the big influence on the, on really on the course of history, if you think about it. And, and it's really a usability issue. So I, I remember I, I saw that, I saw the ballot and uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Maryland then, and my advisor was Tim Peterson. And I printed the ballot, I went to his office, and I said, you need to testify to con to Congress about this. <laughs> Uh, he was the uh, the director of the UCL uh, back then, and uh, so that's when I first saw the the, the connection uh, between what I was studying and uh, and public policy, and that uh, was part of the motivation for when after I got my PhD I wanted to stay in the DC area if possible. That's where my family was, so I took a job in government. So I worked uh, at the Census Bureau for about two and a half years in their research division, and I was the one fighting for usability and usable government from yeah. within an agency. I lasted two and a half years. Uh, so it, it's a challenge to fight it from, from the inside. There are, one thing we have to realize that throughout the world, many agencies, many governments do have uh, usability, user experience, HCI professionals working there. So there are uh, people who are from our profession who do the same things that we do with similar training who are out there and they're trying to get things done. Oftentimes, as Jonathan mentioned, though, the 
decision makers higher up be not necessarily all that aware about these issues, um, may not have the training necessary to understand the importance. Uh, so it becomes a challenge, and I think there is a role for coming from the outside as experts and uh, in influencing the way government works. And increasingly, it's, it's really just about making our lives better, making the lives of our neighbors better. Uh, because let's face it, now we want to, whenever you want to interface with, with your local government, with your national government, you're increasingly doing it through electronic, right? an electronic uh, manner. And if that's not well designed, you're going to suffer, your neighbor suffers, um, and, uh, and we're all in trouble. And if you want, uh, I, I know we're, we all enjoy our conferences, we all enjoy our research. At the end of the day, it, it's so much nicer, though, if you can have a big impact with some of the things that you do. That impact something that can impact lots and lots of people. And I think uh, if you can impact public policy, that's one way of doing that. Uh, now I'm experiencing, as uh, Jonathan was mentioning earlier, I've been assigned to the advisory committee also for the Census Bureau, and now, now it's the ACB is listening. I can go tell the director of the Census Bureau, no, I think you should do this, and, uh, and they're, they're listening. So it's, uh, sometimes it's a little bit, a lot easier to be coming from the outside to, to give recommendations and, and just be listened to and, uh, and, and hopefully help, help the agencies do a better job and they, they appreciate it. I think it's a win-win situation in those cases. One other thing that I mentioned in terms of the impact of government and how it's related to ACI is a completely different experience and something that I've been involved mostly as a, as a, as a witness and an advisor to some degree. Uh, is things that are happening in the country where I spend most of my childhood. It's Uruguay. Uh, and it's one of the few countries that's implemented uh, my laptop for child program. So every child in elementary, public elementary school gets a laptop. Uh, so that's government really impacting access to computing in a very significant way. Now there's seven and eight for work. Every, reti every retiree is going to get a, a tablet. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, so if you want to get a free tablet, you're over 65, you know where to go. <laughs> uh, so, so I've seen that, that impact, and I think that's what drives my, my interest. Fantastic. Uh, my background is somewhat similar to the stories that you hear uh, from the other panelists. So looking back, the only evidence that I see that I might have interest in public policy is in uh, when I was about maybe 12 through 16 years old, um, I served as a summertime intern for a local state delegate, a state legislator. You know, I worked on constituent surveys, did some surveys, things like that. Um, and that was interesting. Then I went off to college and um, I decided I want to study human computer interaction. And so in college, in graduate school, I never studied public policy. This wasn't my background or my focus. Uh, I was very interested in user diversity issues, and I've been working on user diversity and accessibility for, for over two decades. And as I was doing accessibility research, you know, I started partnering with disability advocacy groups, so groups like the National Federation of the Blind and the National Down Syndrome Congress. And I've been working with them, and you know, I've been doing sort of core human computer interaction research. And I start getting calls. Hey, do you have any research on this topic? Do, do, you, have any, do you have any articles about government compliance with accessibility regulations? Do you have any research about how uh, effective people with disabilities are in terms of their uh, task performance. Do you and, and I start getting call after call, and then they say, you know, there's there's going to be a uh, disability advocates. I mean, they, they call me and say there's there's going to be um, a hearing in the state legislature. Could you come testify about this bill and just talk about your expertise and how it relates to the bill? I said sure. And it kind of snowballed from there. At the same time, I've been talking with some of the people you know, within Sinkai. And in 2004, there were some issues that came up that SIGCHI needed to respond to related to human computer interaction, public policy in the US. And so they contacted a few of us who founded, who co founded, I should say, five or six of us, the uh, US SIGCHI Public Policy Committee. And I worked for about two years on that, and then I became chair of that committee. And then I got involved with ACM more globally, the larger umbrella of US public policy for ACM. And again, it, it just kind of, it, the more you get involved, the more you see the impact that you can make, as the panelists are talking about, you say, wow, I need to keep doing this. I need to talk with my legislators. I need to talk with our policymakers. And you realize that there's a whole other angle of making a difference. It's being out there connecting with the public policy world. And it just uh, continued to, my, my interest continued to grow. 
the ability that I saw to really have an influence and impact and make the quality of life better, it kind of gets you all charged up, it gets you excited, and you want to keep working uh, in that realm. And so I actually spent uh, my sabbatical in 2012, 2013, I won a fellowship to the Radcliffe Institute at uh, Harvard to study disability rights law and how it relates to my human-computer interaction work for people with disabilities. And so I think once you get involved, and once you understand, and once you see the impact that it can make, it, it just it charges you up. It, it's hard to stay out of it because you see how we can get our work to really have such an impact. So I've always enjoyed that. What we're gonna do next is each panelist will talk for a few minutes about their area of expertise. So uh, privacy, voting, e-government, funding, ergonomics. They'll talk about these topics and really address where have the successes been and where do you see many barriers? Do you want to start with, do you want to start with yours? Sure. Okay, do you have to plug in or are you? No, no, I'm here. I'm you're just going to talk. You're going to go. So, okay, go for it. Ted, go for it. Yeah. Um, so 14 and a half percent of uh, registered voters are dyslexic. Those people are likely to have three times the errors of the rest of us. Um, that, that's a number I got from an experiment I did in New York City. Um, simulating, um, and we found that we were able to, with a user interface that feedback and structured the activity, we were able to get rid of that three times uh, um, difference. In fact, with that same um, user interface, we were able to get 30% less errors for everyone. Now, if you remember in, um, in 2000, 3.2% of people that went to vote did not, uh, excuse me, that's in, that's in Georgia. 1.9% uh, of people world, uh, countrywide did not select president, but who went into the... In, in the United States. In the United States. In the, United States. In the U.S. presidential election. In 2000. 2000. Yeah. Um, and and what, was, what were the causes of that? Well, uh, two, there were three causes. Registration, ballot design, and polling place operations. All of those had to do with user experience. In, by 2002, we had that down to 1.2% because we fixed several problems. I mean, they, they, we, had, we had people finding registration ballots in the backs of trunks. Uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, people um, locally making their ballots without supervision. Supervision seems to be a big, big piece of it. If you had, if I had my slides up there, you'd see I had all these wonderful pictures. I went and did a lot of polling place watching. I've watched hundreds of polling places, and it's really fun. If any of you guys care to do it, you always can see something interesting about how people make mistakes in polling places. It's the strangest thing because there's nothing simpler than the syntactic activity of making a mark. However, it has to do with, as I said, something stressful, something important, you, you lose your mind. So in 2002, what was amazing, actually 2004, we had, we, we had a situation where people have said, political scientists the worldwide have said, 1% of people go into the polling place and mean not to vote. We've never seen any place where people voted uh, for, for the top uh, person, uh, the top race, uh, more than uh, without leaving 1% of the landmark. We thought those were protest votes. In 2004, we had 0.4% residuals. That means that everybody but 0.4%, that's half of what anybody thought was possible, in four states, Nevada, Maryland, Georgia, and um, Florida. And what was different about those places is that people had feedback while they were making selections. That was with the, excuse me, DREs. And what was, uh, what's interesting about that is that we do know that when people have feedback uh, with even paper uh, ballots, they make uh, half a percent less errors than if they, if, than if they have, than they are centrally counted. And so we had this huge improvement, unfortunately, even though they weren't the top reasons that votes were lost, uh, security dominated, and we tried to make these verify these verifiable um, paper trails. As a user of uh, the expert, I went and tested these paper trails, um, and I found that actually, um, of, uh, when you put when we made these uh, intentionally made errors on the paper trail ballot uh, thing, um, actually, um, eight percent of the people actually recognized two errors. When I made an audio, um, excuse me, audio uh, verified um, verification, that means immediate feedback, where if you say Schwarzenegger and it says Smith, you hear Smith. Um, we, we had suddenly 80% uh, people notice it. Could I make a change with that? A little bit difficult. In, uh, in to, to change the story of, uh, that was, that was uh, 
the watchword of the people that were trying to make a policy at that time. Um, I, I just, I don't know, I'll give one more little er, uh, example. I know I don't want to take all of our time, but I've got dozens and dozens of these. Um, an example is Sarasota uh, in 2006. Um, Catherine Harris, who was the person that actually stopped the, the recount in 2000, was a, was a, uh, was a, was a um, representative who was um, leaving for office. And um, so it was a very high profile um, election. It was the second one on the ballot. 16.7% of people didn't vote for that race. It was very strange. Second race on the ballot, and they're not, everyone called fraud. There were, there were lot legal suits. I went and did an experiment, and when I did my experiment, using the same ballot design, just a couple days later, I wanted to figure it out fast. Um, I found no down ballot problem. And then I did another one, more a better, a better version of it, more like the one that really happened. I got the real election machines, didn't find it. It was because I was giving everyone sample ballots. When you had sample ballots, no errors. When you had, when you didn't have sample ballots, that is, you didn't have something to, to look at while you did it. Uh, I was getting even worse, 18%. Uh, and it was because that race was two candidates, and the one above it was uh, was eight, and right below it said state. So there's a big headline dragging your eye down the down the page, and you actually missed that that race unless you went went uh, went and did it. Uh, and, 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 and had a guide to it. So I say give everyone sample ballots. Uh, there's a whole, whole lot of things that we learn. Um, just, just, to, just to put this up here, if you can't use DREs, uh, at least structure the experience. And this is a, uh, um, uh, a, a device that, that structures and magnifies it. If you have tremor, if you have memory loss, six and a half to seven and a half percent of uh, registered voters have memory loss. Um, this can reduce your errors, same way as those other things. So okay. I say invent and test, and you can make big improvements. And anyone who wants to talk to me about this later, I've got 100 more examples. Great, thank, thank you, Ted. Herrick, next. Yeah. Uh, move the mic closer, please. Right, thank you. Uh, so first of all, the members, and then a little bit about you. Um, uh, uh, government ministries in, in, in my environment in my culture, um, they tend to work, to work with uh, professional organizations um, if they are there and, and they will continue their relationship with these organizations irrespective of the, let me say, the current political composition of the government, which changes all the time, but, but relations. And, and so professional organizations are important to work with the government bodies, especially with the ministries where the actual work is being done. And, and so when uh, around 1990, Kai Netherlands developed as a strong, a relatively strong uh, Dutch group of, of academics and industry on H on human computer interaction, um, this was the, immediately seen as, as the, the speaking partner of, of uh, ministries like the Ministry of Economic Affairs. They recognized that this was like 500 people to represent HCI expertise. And, and, and so they, were willing to work with and, and actually decided that, that a delegation of the, the Kai Netherlands group could be the decisive body for a lot of, um, let me say, activities, including money spending. So one of the uh, important thing was to, to decide on granting research projects, pre-competitive research projects where industry and academia work together. Um, the decisions on who to grant and for what research and how to evaluate the, the progress was done by a group from Kai Netherlands working with the ministry. Uh, and the same was true for the, the granting industry, uh, uh, education vouchers for industry to get education on HCI topics. So industry could ask for the course, a dedicated course or help on, and, and for publicity support for HCI standards and education. So that was in a way a big success story, which, which worked for over 10 years. And, and then at a certain moment, Kai Netherlands got silent and got sleepy and, 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 and it stopped. Uh, wait, uh, so, so this is so there is uh, the good news and the bad news. In our type of, of, of political situation, you need a strong professional organization that can show it represents 
all the professionals with the different colors, so both the, the, the practitioners and the, and the scholars, mm -hmm. uh, and the organization should be able to continue to be there and be awake, right? Um, and in Europe is the same thing. For, for a long time, well, Europe changed structure. They, uh, for long, uh, Europe was Europe decision-making on, on related things related to sciences um, was based on what the different countries managed to, to get done. So it's the, the ministries of the different countries worked with Europe, and, and consequently we had we had splendid uh, uh, funding for research for European Russia, like, like Esprit project and COS project and basic research project and so on. And then Europe changed, and, and Europe got more centralized, and for some reason the relation between national bodies and, and the European bodies got cut off. It's Europe doing things, and, and ACM Europe did not, not yet be strong enough or was not recognized as a non-profit organization in Europe. It was considered the branch of this US, US, US thing that we don't trust. Right? So for new, new um, well, uh, activities where, where industry and, and academia could work on HCI, in a way, we were too late. There's now this, this uh, uh, Horizon 2020, uh, and funnily enough, SICA was approached, uh, at the time I was president, SICA was approached to import on, on the Horizon 2020 program. At the moment that it was already decided that the HCI component would be human-robot interaction, full stop. Mm. Now, there's nothing against human-robot interaction, but there's more in HCI, right? And the only thing we could do was to write paragraphs about this one, which, uh, which we could stretch as much as we wanted. But it should be recognized as part of your role. So this is a missed chance uh, based on the fact that SICAI, let me say ACM, couldn't show itself as being representing a European reliable body of experts from industry and academia so far. Now they are. And, and, and I'm aware they are now trying to, but, but, but some things we missed. Great, Eric, thank you very much. Okay. Um, yes, I was brought into policy making um, by um, working with one major and one minor um, success story in user driven certification. Um, the whole press certification um, is, is prospering and is going on. And as I said, it also covers um, the social responsibility of manufacturers. And that's very important. Um, but the idea was that they, PCO, uh, the White Collar Center, uh, Union Center, should also engage with software. But this proved to be uh, a bit tricky because they had lost their responsibility for uh, work environments, this Union Center. And uh, this hardware certification is to a large degree on expert evaluation and screening um, uh, on sites. And uh, the software certification is uh, user driven and, and uh, builds on uh, user surveys. Um, so um, for now, uh, it is the individual unions who continue to engage for their members. And um, they've done yearly surveys that show that um, the software out there is problematic. Uh, one figure is that uh, compared to what the systems they would like to have, they lose 25 minutes a day. Um, uh, and this amounts to substantial sums. Uh, and managers uh, lose uh, 31, uh, according to the latest <laughs> survey, um, 21 minutes a day. Um, so what we're doing is um, helping um, the unions to kind of extend their surveys into good examples because nowadays procurement is becoming central. Uh, we're starting to talk about participatory procurement. Um, users, user representatives, HCI people um, employed at the unions um, have a lot uh, to say early in the process, and this, uh, this is what has brought me into ISO 
Um, and uh, really interesting um, standards um, in the uses of word work. We was a bit, we were a bit skeptical to standards, uh, and the technical standards has uh, problems to follow the pace of technology. But the social standards are ahead, I would say, and uh, um, there are. I would like to mention one: the user-centered organization. Uh, it's all about HCI uh, applied to executive boards. Uh, another one is like. Uh, is about enabling, assuring, and executing user centered design in organizations. It's a process standard. And um, it's uh, fascinating to work with them. And um, I have pushed for um, uh, procurement uh, aspects uh, and user participation in procurement. So, so those are the, if not barriers, the frontiers for me. Thank you very much, Ake. Hey, Lori. So, uh, in the United States, um, we actually don't have very many privacy laws, and a lot of our um, privacy protections come from something called notice and choice, where companies provide notice about their data, data protection, um, or their data practices. And um, I've observed that there is a lot of uh, privacy notices that are not particularly usable or useful. Um, and so uh, over the years, my students have actually done a number of research studies where we've done usability evaluations of various uh, forms of privacy notices. Um, uh, one, one of my favorites is one where, where um, we tested the different ways that users are supposed to be able to opt out of being tracked online. Um, and we tested nine different approaches and they were all disasters and we wrote a paper called Why Johnny Can't Opt Out. Um, <laughs> that, that paper has been cited in congressional testimony, in um, FTC reports, uh, it, it's, been, um, it's been fairly influential. It, it is an influential paper, yes. yeah. I think we've all read it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, but, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we continue to get bad privacy notices and um, uh, bad, bad privacy icons and, and other mechanisms. Um, when I started at the FTC, um, I, I was very interested in talking about this because the FTC uh, does go after companies for, um, for uh, deceptive practices and, and for privacy related um, uh, problems. And um, as I talked to, to FTC staff, I realized that it wasn't just privacy notices, but that the FTC actually is involved in a whole bunch of other types of notices as well. Um, so the FTC uh, regulates uh, energy notices, um, uh, smoking warnings, um, uh, tobacco, um, the, the dry clean only labels on your clothing, um, and then online um, advertising related notices, um, including um, things that tell you that this, this is an ad and not part of your search results. Um, that's all uh, directly or indirectly uh, regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. Now, some of these notices are actually developed by government agencies. Um, and uh, some of them have gone through some testing, uh, but a lot of them actually have not gone through any testing. Uh, because of some of the sort of structural problems with the government. Uh, if the government wants to run a user study they, that has more than nine participants uh, in the United States, it has to uh, get approval through a process that takes 18 months. Um, and that's because of the U.S. Paperwork Reduction Act, an okay? unintended consequence. Um, there are some exceptions. Some agencies have kind of blanket exceptions, which uh, will reduce the, the approval time to one to six months. Um, but, but, it, but in general, this is difficult to do. So for example, the Federal Communications Commission just came up with a new uh, label for um, broadband that tells you the bandwidth and um, throttling or whatever for different broadband companies. Um, it looked very much like the nutrition label. And I talked to some of the people who worked on it and they said they had no time and no budget for testing. So they figured the nutrition label was something that was probably tested and was probably pretty good. So if they just used the same fonts and made the layout look kind of similar, it would probably be good. That was their approach. 
Um, so, so I've been um, looking and saying, well, what, what can the FTC do about this, both for government labels, but also a lot of what we're seeing, especially in the privacy area, is coming from individual companies or from industry associations who will get together and say, let's come up with an icon that says you're being tracked by this advertising, and then all advertising companies will use the same icon. That seems like a great idea. Uh, from our tests, we found that nobody recognizes the icon, nobody understands what it means, and it's a complete disaster. Um, and I don't think the industry tested it. Um, so uh, so I, I've been looking for how the FTC can do something, and in particular, while I'm there for a year, how I can help the FTC, FTC do something. Um, and so uh, stay tuned, um, but I, I'm working on trying to put together a workshop um, and we'll be reaching out to people in the CHI community to come talk about best practices for evaluation. And um, not just that you should test and make sure that people understand the words, but that when you're going to have these sorts of notices and disclosures, they have to make sense in the context in which they're actually used and how people have actually done testing in a variety of different contexts. So that, that is um, something that, that I'll be uh, uh, working on and hope that some of you might be interested in helping with. Great, Great. thank you, Lori. One follow up. All right, so my experience is mostly dealing with the U.S. federal government, so I think we'll, we'll continue on the theme. So I think one of the things that Laura mentioned is, is absolutely true, and that oftentimes, uh, even if uh, a government agency is going to do the right thing and wants to follow uh, human-centered design approaches, their hands are tied sometimes. They're not allowed to do certain testing, or uh, there's uh, they don't have the resources to do certain things. So you remember from, uh, if you went to this morning's keynote with, Vice Mayor, that we're talking about all the strand testing they do, 41 shades of blue. <laughs> That's right. You know, we, <laughs> yeah, they can do that, and you know, if they don't have the resources, it's just not going to happen. So another another barrier, and this is something that's specific to government, is there's no competition to government. So if I don't like my federal form, I can't go and use the Canadian form, right? Uh, and that's that's you know competition is the reason why uh, folks at Google were taste testing the 41 shades of blue. Uh, what's the incentive the uh, government agency has to do something similar? Uh, it's not nearly as much, right? People kind of have to use whatever you give them, um, so that prevents a little bit uh, innovation and really trying to to iterate and, and, and keep doing better. So that's that's a barrier that one's is always going to be there. Um, so it's a challenge. Uh, another barrier, I think, has to do with, with uh, something that Pocket was, was mentioning earlier with respect to procurement. Mm. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, it's not equal at uh, government agencies who are actually putting together the software that you end up using on your website. Uh, it's oftentimes contractors who do that. And uh, so the government has to put up a contract and hire somebody to do something specific. And the challenge is oftentimes when you do that, you have to tell them, this is what we want you to do. We all know, you know, if you went back, did, went to the CHI conference 30 years ago, you would have known, yes, you know, having the requirement, knowing the requirements ahead of time is really difficult and they're gonna change. Uh, but if you hire somebody to do X, Y, and Z, they're gonna do X, Y, and Z, and you realize along the way, well, you know, we really have to change that requirement. That's gonna cost a lot of extra more money, it's gonna cause problems. And that's another challenge, is you, whenever you have these contracts out, oftentimes you have people at government agencies who may not have software engineering or CI backgrounds trying to put together, doing the best they can, they're smart, dedicated people, to, but they're trying to put together these requirements that might change over time. It's hard to do the iterative processes that we know work best, and that's one of the areas where slowly things are changing, I think. I, I'm seeing some, some things that are happening a little bit better in some agencies where there's a recognition that this is a necessity, but we, we also still see uh, failures and, and, uh, and projects involving um, government and software. So, so the most recent with, the, with Obamacare, right? Here in the US, uh, the Affordable Care Act set up a website where people have signed up for health insurance and it didn't work very well for the first month or so. Um, and it's, it's not the first time it happened. It's happened with administrations of every, uh, every color, every, uh, from the left to the right, back to the left. So uh, it's, it's a more uh, 
it's an issue with the way government runs things and, and some of the limitations that people, even, even if they know the right thing to do, are limited in what they can do. Great, thank you, Juan Pablo. Uh, I'll briefly discuss interface accessibility for people with disabilities. Uh, that's my area of work. And I would say that successes are that we have the right resources in place. We have technical solutions. So we have these great international standards called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And we also have a set of guidelines to how do you apply those web guidelines to non-web technologies and make them accessible for people with disabilities. So we've got really great technical guidelines for accessibility. We've got really great inclusive design processes. We have evaluation methods such as usability testing involving people with disabilities, uh, expert inspections, and automated tools can be useful in large-scale websites. So we've got, all, we've got a great toolbox. Right? The question is, why do we still seem to have so much trouble with government making their web technology accessible? And often what happens is that you have governments at all levels in all countries, this is not limited to one country or, or one level of government, you know, uh, province, town. Government agencies often have no idea if their technology is accessible or not. They have no idea. And they receive a complaint from people with disabilities and they say, we simply didn't know. So often two problems are that no one is monitoring the accessibility, and obviously if you are not monitoring to determine if technology is accessible, it will not be built accessibly and developed accessibly, and if it was built accessibly, it might become inaccessible. You know, content changes all the time on websites. Design patterns change. And so what we need to do is we need to find ways to get government to monitor, for instance, procurement we talked about. Right? With accessibility, there's been some success in procurement, because basically there are a series of approvals when you are when you are purchasing technology, there are financial approvals, and you can add some accessibility requirements to that approval. But that same approach doesn't necessarily work when it comes to just upgrading versions. So, you know, you've got cloud computing, and um, suddenly you log in the next day and it's a new version and it's inaccessible. So while procurement has had some success in government related to, and there are a lot of efforts, you know, the EU mandate 376. Uh, in the EU, Section 508 uh, of the Rehab Act in the US, right? Often, these things are just not followed through. And so, government agencies have not trained their people who do web updates about accessibility. No one's monitoring on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. How are we doing, right? For instance, in the US federal government, uh, one big problem is that federal agencies rarely share information with each other about Section 508 and making websites accessible. So each agency creates their own documentation. And each agency uses their own tools, their own automated tools. They don't share that much. This is documented in the book, Ensuring Digital Accessibility, which I co-authored, right? It discusses all the details on this. The agencies don't share. And so you have federal, federal agencies in the US that don't know if their websites are accessible or not. The other agencies use totally different mechanisms, totally different metrics. And so there's no consistency across agencies, right? Agencies simply don't know. And so I think really the barrier when it comes to uh, accessibility for websites and other technologies in government is we have to take the existing knowledge we know and find a way to get governments to consistently manage it and monitor it and use compliance monitoring techniques. How often are they checking their website? Is, it, is content checked to be accessible before it goes online? Do they check once a month? What methods do they use? What confirmations? Do they have to file annual reports? Do they test, while they test new versions of software for security and compatibility, do they test them for accessibility too? So I think our big challenge uh, in the policy area is getting uh, government agencies, and actually many of these same ideas apply also to, to private companies. If they're covered like they are in the, the UK and the US, if they're covered uh, under laws related to public accommodations and you know, malls, stores, museums, if they have to have accessible technology as well, we need to make sure that they are doing this, that they are making their technology accessible using the same types of compliance monitoring techniques. Thank you.